So we're going to do a Q&A here. Now I hope you guys have been thinking of these burning questions. We've had some very interesting speakers. I've learned a lot. Um, I'm certainly you have. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting tweets I've been reading out there, so I'm sure there's some burning questions. Frank couldn't be here tonight, and she has a very interesting question to Trevor. Ready? Okay. <laughs> Carl had farm to table as his style all the way through the competition and was on the team for Restaurant Wars with Trevor, Curtis, and one other. How was Trevor able to use the name from the Restaurant Wars restaurant for his own when there were three others in that competition? Did he have to ask their permission or just check that no one else had that name? I came up with that name, and the second that Margaret Hewitt said that he was stealing from me, I was like, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> and they never they never actually made that public, I don't think, but at Judge's Table, they, they were like, who came up with the name? And they were like, Trevor did. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say congratulations to like actually this whole room obviously that we're here but actually remind you that sustainability is such an important aspect of what you guys do like Roberta like wow I was crying anyway and the fact I know now to a rebel buy containers and buy your product the question actually is for Michael ocean wise like for instance, I see it on the I see it on the restaurant menu, so I actually buy that way. But as a consumer, how do I actually make a difference? Um, how do I, without volunteering for the organization itself and choosing those products, is there another way I can actually go in and actually make a difference or even contribute somehow? Because I think it's so important. Yeah, that's a really good question, and we, we get that asked a lot. Um, I'm disappointed that you don't want to come volunteer for us, but uh, like you'd be amazed at how just supporting, and, and I go back to what Roberto was saying about the, the farmer's markets. These, the chefs, the restaurants, the markets, the businesses that are that are committing to doing this are, are committed to doing this um, because they believe in it. And it, in, in some cases, not always, and, and in fact it's a bit of a myth that sustainable seafood is gonna be a lot more expensive, but in some cases it is significantly more expensive. Because if you, I mean, even if you just think about it, it makes sense. If you're gonna drag a net across the bottom of the ocean, you're gonna catch an awful lot of fish in a short amount of time. The quality might not be very good because it's jammed in there with everything else, so there's gonna be a lot of bruising, scarring, and wastage of that fish. It's not. It's not the best way to do it. Um, so the quality is much better. If you have to change and, and go now to a hook and line, it's gonna take you a lot more effort and a lot longer to catch the same amount of fish. You need to get more value for that fish in order to make that work. And so when these chefs take this on, it's, it increases their food costs in some cases. It's a lot more difficult to find the producers. So one of the biggest things that we do in our job is, is really trying to help them source these products. Find the producers that are doing things the right way and help them. It's a huge job to try and do that and sift through all this information. So, I mean, the best thing you can do is support those people. If you want to even take this one step farther, Talk to your stores or your local restaurants that aren't ocean-wise. Get them involved. Tell them it's important to you. You know, one of the things that I think is really amazing, and sorry, I'm, uh, you're trying to ask more questions and I just can't shut up, but the one thing that's been really amazing to, to us is that the chefs are, the chefs are really, and, and especially the top chefs, they're the early adopters. You know, they're the ones that are setting the culinary trends. They're, you know, in some cases they have the freedom to be able to, to do this and they run the kitchen and, and uh, are the celebrities of the restaurant. So they, they might have a little bit more freedom to be able to do this. But what happens is when we go out to any of these great chefs restaurant, try something that's sustainable that we maybe never tried before, we like it. And then we go into our local grocery store and we say, hey, remember when we were at Fable and we tried those fresh local sardines and they were fantastic? Well, maybe we would try those at home. And then you ask the grow your local grocery store, do you have the fresh local sardines? Do you have any sustainable products that are, that are you know, locally caught and sustainable or whatever it is. You know, five, six years ago, none of the markets ever had it. None of the retailers ever had it. Now you're starting to see them scramble to get it because people keep asking. It changes things. Believe me, it changes things. And, and I think just, you know, really saying, telling your local stores, everything, you know, markets that this is what you want. You're demanding this. 
it changes everything and it, and it will trickle down to the eventual point of, of raising the ear of, of managers and politicians that uh, that will change policy with this. Look, if you have an iPhone, download the free iPhone app, it Google, it, it GPSs your position, shows you all the partners around. On, on the website, uh, oceanwise.ca oceanwise does the same thing, it maps your position and it shows you all the partners around there, support the partners that are, that are uh, committed to doing this. This one will be to Roberta and our two chefs. I don't know if you saw when uh, we were coming in, they had a display for the uh, viaducts and what they're going to do with them. I didn't notice anything about putting um, farmers or urban gardens or anything in there where people could, could grow their own vegetables. But I think that'd be a good idea as well. You know, lots of people downtown, they don't have the garden space. So I thought that might be something interesting and just uh, what your ideas or thoughts on it? We're, we're pr obviously pro any turning any uh, cement into a food space, and that's, that's what we do, and, and we're partners with lots of community garden organizations. Um, I'm sh maybe you've seen the, the Concord Pacific lands and what Soul Food is doing, um, growing food there with um, hundreds of garden beds on the Concord Pacific lands that have been sitting there empty for several years. So, it's nice to be able to see animation of those empty spaces and derelict, um, derelict lots, um, and, and they're, they've got a, a free lot, a free lease of that land for the next few years. So it's it's great to see that. I mean, the viaducts open up a world of possibilities, and whether they come down or stay up, there could be um, a bit much better use for that land that they're currently um, occupying than than what we're what we're doing with it. Also, just pay attention to the number of community gardens opening up. I just got a plot in the Brewery Creek Garden at uh, Guelph and Sixth. And at the same time, if you investigate, there are a number of urban agriculture um, organizations operative in the Vancouver area, one being Fresh Roots Organics, which now has an agreement with, I think, 25 to 30 schools to turn schoolyard space into urban agricultural space and then have that be kind of a a, a new classroom, essentially a garden as a classroom for kids to do with uh, initiatives somewhat like Helen's. Um, so there is, there is a lot going on. I think, you know, over the next 10 or 15 years, <coughs> you can expect that any green space whatsoever not covered by viaduct expansion will be converted into, you know, more of a practical space. Thank you. I just want to preface by saying, Trevor, Trevor I'm really glad that you didn't get Elizabeth as your sous chef. You were pulling the knife and I was like really banking but my question is actually for Michael and Ocean Wise. Um, so, so my best friend is a, is a marine biologist, and so my concerns about um, sustainability and seafood go beyond just my personal convictions. And I'm curious to know, I know with us being situated so close to the ocean that uh, sushi is a big pull for us in this sort of culinary market. What kind of penetration does Ocean Wise have into the sushi market? Because Personally, I've got like the Monterey Bay Seafood Watch app on my phone, but if you're not really paying attention, it can be really hard to kind of get into where your seafood is coming from when you're in the sushi market. So I was wondering if you could speak towards that topic at all. Yeah, that's a great question, actually. And, you know, that's that's really where Oceanwise came from, was from Monterey Bay Aquarium developed, if you haven't seen it, the, the uh, Seafood Watch program, these little wallet guides you fold up and they have green, yellow, red of what things you should look for, what things you should avoid when you're in restaurants or, or grocery stores. Fantastic idea that they started back in 1999. Obviously the Vancouver Aquarium works very closely with Monterey Bay Aquarium on many different things. We actually started handing out those cards at the Vancouver Aquarium at, in 2000 and the whole reason we started OceanWise was because of that program. You know. It was a great idea and we noticed that consumers were really getting engaged with that idea but it, they were very difficult to use in practicality they gave you the right pointers but you know something like tuna, tuna which is a very popular item and in in most sushi joints and things like that but in most restaurants it's it's also in every single category depending on exactly where it's caught how it's caught and uh, what species it is you know so you ask the server the questions you know, where's this called? What species is this? What's the Latin name? How is it, you know? <laughs> and what are the chances they're gonna give you the answer? You know, they have no idea. So, and, and in fact, the suppliers probably in the many cases have no ideas as well because tuna is bought on a common market and mixed. So you don't know how it's being caught. 
Uh, so it gets very, very tricky, and this is why we, th where we thought, well, we can dig into this, and we can find out, and we can, and we can get those answers and, and help identify those and verify those items. Um, but your question on sushi, we, we do have a few sushi restaurants in town that are on board with OceanWise. Zen Sushi in West Vancouver was the first to really step up, take the plunge, and, and give it a shot. Um, and we've been working on and off with Tojo for years, but, uh, but Tojo's his own, his own master too. So, but we, we do have a few, we have a handful of sushi restaurants locally that are on board and, and committed to serving sustainable seafood. But one of the things that I think is interesting about sushi is that it's a bit of a misnomer to think that, you know, a lot of people feel it's sushi, it's different, it's weird seafood that we're not used to, it's not traditional for Western culture, so it must be bad. But in a lot of cases, it's actually, there are some of these options that are used are really great sustainable options. You know, these things that are common there, sablefish, uh, spot prawns. We, six years ago, 100% of our spot prawns were being shipped to Japan. We never got them here. We had to create this whole idea of a spot prawn festival, work with the DC Chef's Table Society, really spearheaded this, and, and work with local fishermen to try and get them to keep them here so that we could have them. Um, sable fish. All of our sable fish was going to Japan 10 years ago. We never ate it here. Now it's one of the most popular items, but that's because we're trying to find alternatives, good sustainable alternatives. So I would just say that one thing is, is that um, a lot of times these, these non-traditional items are great sustainable items. Um, but having said that, we would love to work more and more within the Asian community, not just Japanese, but uh, Chinese and, and uh, all sorts of the Asian cultures, because we have some of the best Asian cuisine, as Stephanie was saying, in the world right here in Vancouver. One of the things that we've talked about for a few years is the fact that, you know, traditionally there's been a, a well, I think one of the things, there's been a bit of a disconnect between kind of the traditional and cultural Asian um, cuisine and the Western cuisine in media. You know, a lot of these papers are produced in Cantonese or Mandarin or, or English, or, but not both. So the cultures are getting different stories. Mm -hmm. And we're not sharing the same information. And I think there's a real need for, you know, people like Stephanie that will bridge that gap and, and give, provide us the information and the stories in both cultures, and that's very important, and it's happening. Um, we, we may have some exciting exciting stuff coming up on that front soon as well. I'm not gonna ruin the surprise yet, though. Well, that's good to hear. I know there's been a lot of really exciting work with both Spot Prams and Sablefish um, on our, in, our, in our fair city, um, but I mean, if you are aware of certain types of sushi that might be more sustainable, it would be great to see some recommendations from you guys that we could take to our local kind of hole-in-the-wall sushi joints for what we should and shouldn't be eating. It's really difficult. They're on there. Actually. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a good, we do have a list of seafood recommendations, yeah. but we it's don't do a specific sushi one like Monterey Bay does, which is, a, that's that's really great because then you yeah. can see, you know, Gindara is sable fish is good type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't, we haven't done that yet, but Seafood Watch is a great site and, and we share information with them. Uh, sea Choice does a, a sushi guide as well, and, and that's a great source of information as well. Um, we can look at doing that for sure. Uh, I left propaganda up there if you want to see some good <laughs> options. But uh, some of the most popular things like sablefish, pop prawns, uh, albacore tuna, yes. another one that's, that's really great and popular. Um, it was nice also to see in the finals that chefs were using good options. I love it when Food Network accidentally shows sustainable seafood. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, I'm just kidding. I mean, I, but uh, the chefs on, on, uh, on season two, it was great to see. Like, you did the Arctic char, and uh, there was, there, there Carl was did the, the Polar Four Springs uh, trout, which is great. There's a good one. Um, I think it was Jimmy. Uh, who was for one of the for one of the challenges? He was going to use uh, it was the tuna casserole. He was looking for albacore tuna, and McEwen's didn't have it. And like behind the scenes, that shit was crazy, man. <laughs> Canel, I'm sure you know Canel. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He's like he's like what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> he was pissed, and like 
McKean was like, oh my god, like removed himself from that situation immediately, and it was, uh, it was a, it, it's interesting to see, like, as chefs, you know, there's, we, we influence the way a lot of people eat, and, and, uh, yeah, I mean, we, a lot of us do genuinely care about this, and, you know, yeah, it, it was, it was funny how that just did not get televised. As <laughs> <laughs> there was interviews on it, like, every one of us were like, this is bullshit. Canal scares me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I just love the other I, can I add um, something to um, what you were saying, and also the lady talking about um, you know, how to help as a consumer. As a consumer, we always have to let the other side of the table know that we want what is the best for like, ocean-wide sustainability, for the earth, for our younger generations. For example, whenever I go into a sushi restaurant, when I see not the sustain, sustainable ocean-wise item, I will let them know. And then you strike a conversation. A lot of these chefs, okay, they are there just for the paycheck. They don't care anything else. But if we raise enough voice just to raise that awareness, we're getting places. Like we said, we're taking small steps. How long did it take you? Ocean-wise started when? 2000. Yeah, see? And, and today, you know, you have a lot of restaurants that are involved, and you said earlier that even, you know, people from overseas, from the other side of the world come in and asking about ocean-wise, right? And I realized a lot of people don't do that. They eat whatever they do, and talk about sushi restaurants, say, all the all you can eat. They could, someone is gonna kill me when, when I say this. They don't care about whatever they put on the table. You might be getting yourself a good deal by the number sign, but they are the worst restaurant to support you. I am sorry. And if you want to do something, you know, like go and like nowadays you have your Twitter, you have your iPad or whatever that gives you all the information. Do that. And that is what you could do, at least. Thank you. <laughs> Questions for Trevor. Um, I know you were recently involved with another startup that uh, I was interested in finding out about, and maybe you can share it with the rest of the room, and that's Harvest. Yeah. Uh, Michael is, uh, I don't know, I, he, I, when I was looking for a restaurant when I first got back from the show, I, I stumbled upon his space, and I was just curious about real estate, like what's going to cost me in what part of town, you know, and just feeling things out, and I came upon Michael, and he's been uh, one of the most incredible people I've ever met in my life. I mean, if you've ever met the guy, he is so nice and just such a genuine person. Um, he, uh, he, he just, we, we, we just met up, he's like, hey, you wanna go grab a coffee sometime? And I'm like, yeah, he's gonna be my friend for the rest of my life, for sure. And uh, yeah, we just started talking, he's sitting down, he's like, hey, I wanna start like this, 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 you know, local food hub. And I was like, cool. I'm like, I want to start a local food restaurant. I was like, cool. And then, then he's like, I need help because I have no idea what I'm doing. It's like, I kind of know that industry. Like, I'll help you out. <laughs> and it's really funny to, to see him come along this journey because, you know, everybody's like, I want to own a restaurant one day. And it's like, I'm actually witnessing somebody that has no business owning a restaurant <laughs> own a food operation. And it's hilarious. <laughs> um, but it, I mean, in terms that guy like pulls people together, like you would not believe, like he creates such a good vibe and gets uh, gets farmers together and people together and he just creates such a vibe for things and he's really good at connecting people together uh, and Harvest is doing a great great job at doing that. Um, unfortunately I've not been able to help him as much as I would have liked to right now uh, and I feel a bit bad for it but uh, but yeah he's, he's doing a really cool thing and, and Harvest itself is pushing a very good thing and uh, yeah it's, it's a really cool space. So Trevor's talking about Harvest Community Foods, which is actually on Union Street near Maine. Yeah. And I actually, I actually met Mike in a different way, because I actually was speaking to uh, at East Van Love a few months ago, and I was one of the speakers, and so was Mike. And that's how I met him, and that's how I kind of got involved with that whole idea, and that's how we met Mr. Mike. So yeah, absolutely. That's very true. Yeah. This question's for uh, Mr. Trevor. Make it short and sweet. You were talking about that dish that uh, wowed the judges um, for the interview to get a Top Chef. What was that dish? I'm sorry. When you went in, you didn't have a chance to make a video, and you like they told you to come in to make a dish. I'm just yeah. curious, what was that dish that you made that got you on the TV show? Olive oil poached char and uh, fennel marmalade. <laughs> not bad. Not bad. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, all 
like that was one of the dishes, the olive oil bush charge is a technique that yeah, it's badass. That. You try it and you're like, yeah. I can't believe this is a piece of fish. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I also use that in my final. Yeah, yeah. 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 I want to talk to you about how to do that. <laughs> and that dish is on your menu. I think as I well. said in the in the in the show. Last I was like, like, damn, how did you do that? Well, I, I say in the show, I'm like, you should be able to take a bath in it. Yeah, in your you oil. The temperature has to be yeah. perfect. You, you just want to take one that's warm, like, like mm, oh. <laughs> <laughs> your fish is doing that. There, your fish is just like. Ah. <laughs> so I mean, I've accidentally stuck my fingers in oil things before, and it's never been good. So I've got an, an, an east meets west question here for you too about uh, what's happening with regards to um, changing people's attitudes towards um, shark fins. Shark fins. Shark fins. Well, down my alley, because I am actually on the board of uh, Shark Truth. Um, you know that. <laughs> Only because I'm so nosy. I have to put my nose in everything. Um, shark well, you know what, as a matter of fact, if you talk to um, any random Chinese, a lot of them don't really understand why the fuss. Because uh, we have been eating um, shark, shark, shark fin for as long as I can remember. But fortunately, the younger generation are starting to come into realization what we have been doing to these poor sharks and subsequently to the ocean. And um, that's hope there, you know, we see at the end of the tunnel a very strong light. The fact that Port Moody actually has come on board to ban it, um, San Francisco did the same thing, Hawaii already have banned, and what we're trying to push is hopefully um, Vancouver, uh, but as far as we're concerned, they are not listening because of Again, you know, they actually have to entertain, make sure that the, um, the taxpayers, the business person, the restaurants, they are not going to be annoyed, right? But um, there is always a possibility that I would hope in five, ten years' time, we would not see any more shots being killed for the fins. And if you do, you know, like talk to your Chinese friends. Um, a lot of them don't have a clue. I actually was interviewed by CTV about this and um, the report also went to one of the table, we are in a Chinese restaurant, to ask that, I think he's in his th mid-30s, and his answer was, what's wrong with that? It's just like killing a pig. I mean, to me, it's a very sad thing that they do not realize exactly the big difference between killing a pig for food and killing a shark just for the shark fin, for a, a bowl of soup, right? So, as savvy food, Eaters, you know, like you guys also can start talking to your friends about like why we're so concerned about this. Because at the end of the day, there might not be any more of these shots left. You know how many we kill on the, on the, on an annual basis? We're talking about tons. And we're talking about 70... 70 to 100 million. Million tons. I mean, like the, the, the number is staggering and it's actually very scary. Can you imagine we kill, not just, okay, let's not look at shark, just look at other things. If we are talking about 70 to 100 million tons and we don't need the bowl of soup. And yes, I hope that, you know, obviously you guys will not, well, maybe some of them, because I do, oops, I do see some Chinese or Asian faces. But Try, you know, like straight competition. Ask why, why do you eat, you know how they kill, why they kill, and then that. Any little thing helps. And one more thing, about what you're doing. Okay, I do actually have boxes of laptop, uh, not laptop, but plastic boxes as containers that I use whenever I go into the res restaurant. And I use my own containers for leftovers. Yay! <laughs> Start doing that.